Good morning, Hope community. It is Thursday, February 24th, and I hope you guys are enjoying um, your day so far. Today we are in Romans chapter 3, and we have to take our time with this one because he's it's still very rich. He's saying a lot of things here. Um, but before we get started, let's um, say a quick prayer. Father, we thank you that you will speak to us through your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. So, chapter 3 starts with, What advantage then has a Jew, or what is a prophet of circumcision? Um, he's finishing a thought here. We're not finishing, but he's going off a thought. Um, at the end of chapter 2, he's talking about circumcision. And because he's trying to, he's calling Christians to, to be above the law. And he's making this distinction that to be above the law doesn't mean that the law doesn't apply. And we'll, we'll, we'll read that in a little bit um, if we get to it. But I'm just going to summarize kind of what he's talking about here. Because um, there's still Jews who want to make the law their savior. And it's not Jesus is our savior. You cannot find righteousness through the law. So at the end of um, so at the end of chapter two, Paul is making this distinction: like, hey, if there's a Jew who is circumcised but he's doing unrighteous things, then he's an unrighteous person. It doesn't matter if he's circumcised or not. If he's doing things that are, if he's breaking God's law, then he's considered unrighteous. He says in the same way, if there's someone who's not circumcised like a Gentile, but they're doing righteous things and they're following God, shouldn't we count them as righteous? Like, that's the distinction he's making. So he's talking about, well, so we know that circumcision isn't about, it's not, it's not an outward thing. It's a, it's a circumcision of the heart. You know, it's, so he's talking about righteousness is accounted to us. We're righteous if we're doing God's will not because of any exterior thing. That's what he's talking about. So he's making a decision. He's making a distinction that now, um, now righteousness comes from our heart. It's not about the law. And then he goes on later to say, the law couldn't make us righteous anyway. So this is kind of where we pick up on, on this thought, on this thing, because he's trying to, he's trying to show us that, um, that, how do I say it? That this righteousness comes from, from inside. Does that make sense? It's not, not anything that we can do on the outside that could cause us to be right with God. So, chapter 3, verse 1 says, What advantage then has a Jew, or what is a prophet of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Um, he's talking about Jews here in the Old Testament. He said, or well, before Jesus, I should say, under the law. Like if if the Jews didn't believe in God, or if they had they had unbelief, does that mean God doesn't exist, or does that mean God isn't faithful? It's like no, like we can't change who God is. That's what he's saying. We cannot change who God is, and that's a great thing. Amen. Um, we can't cause God to be to 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 change his character. We can't make God not love us. Like we can't. And everything God does, He does it through love. Amen? Everything God does, He does it because He loves us. And there's nothing we can do to change that. That's called unconditional love. Amen? That's what He's saying. He's saying, can we change who God is? No. Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar. Amen? That's something that we need to grasp on in our hearts. As it is, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words, and may overcome when you are judged. Um, if 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 you if if you see that you may and may overcome when you are judged, what he's talking about? He's saying people people are judging God as being unrighteous or unfaithful or being unfair. That that that's what Paul's quoting the scripture that's saying that, and that's what Paul is going to talk about right now is that people judge God to people are judging God, and we shouldn't be doing that. Verse 5, but if our righteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. Certainly not, for how will God judge the world? For if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, why am I still why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, Let us do evil that good may come? 
as we are slanderously reported and as some affirm that we say their condemnation is just so what is Paul saying here um, so people are judging Paul and other people that run with Paul they're judging Paul in this they're saying Paul is preaching that you can do it. Paul is preaching that you can break the law and you can be okay Paul is preaching that you can do evil things and you're okay. Paul is preaching this gospel of grace that covers sins. And so you can do whatever you want because, you know, when you sin, um, then the grace of God covers that. And then the more you sin, the more grace you have. And so we're saying, so, and he's saying this is slanderous. He's, so people are accusing Paul of saying you can sin as much as you want because the grace of God will always cover it. And the more you sin, the more grace you get. That People are accusing Paul of that. And that's what Paul and that's what Paul is defending. He's like, no, like, you know, if if my sin incre increases the grace of God, if if my sin is what causes God's righteousness to come upon me, then why am I still a sinner? Like that doesn't make sense. Like why am I still being judged? Shouldn't I still be judged? Why am I still being judged as a sinner if my sin causes God's righteousness to come over me? Like this doesn't make sense. Um and then, and then he's in verse eight. He says, "Then why not say, let's do evil, so that, so that, um, so that good may come." So people are saying that this is what Paul is preaching, saying this is not what I'm talking about. People, I'm not saying that your sin brings about God's goodness. I'm not saying that. I'm saying repentance brings about God's goodness. Or sorry, what he said was that the goodness of God leads us to repentance, a transformed life. But people are so caught up with what to do and what not to do because of the law. This is why he's referencing circumcision. People are so caught up. This is what he's breaking. He's breaking this idea that you can be saved by what you do. Salvation can, comes by what you do. It doesn't. Salvation comes through a person of Jesus Christ. Repenting and allowing Jesus through his Holy Spirit to come inside of you. Of make you born again into a new creation. Amen? And, and, and here's what we see in verse 9. It says, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. We're all sinners. We're all sinners that need a Savior. Even if you did everything perfect under the law, your heart was still unpure. Even if you did everything, no matter what you've done, how perfect you think you are, all of us, both Jews and Greeks, were all sinners in need of a Savior. Um, verse ten, as as it is written, he's quoting Psalm. Um, he's he's quoting Psalms right here, I believe. Um, as it is written, there is, um, yeah, Psalms thirty six, I think. Doesn't matter. We'll look it up later. <laughs> um, chapter ten. Uh, sorry, verse ten. So as as it as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They all have turned aside. They all have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now this sounds very, very outrageous, but 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 um, if you're not born again, you've been born in sin. So what is the writer right here is David of this psalm? We've all sinned, guys. We we all have impure hearts until we get born again. Amen. So verse 19, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. This is very important right here. By the law is the knowledge of sin. God established the law to expose our sin, not to tell us that what we're doing is sin. Does that make sense? Let, let me rephrase it a different way. Um, Paul, um, God gave us the law through Moses to show us that the things we do are sin. Because without the standard, there is no sin. Does that make sense? Sorry. Without the standard, there's no knowledge of breaking that standard. So, you know, if you ever, 
if if you ever go into a culture and you do something that you shouldn't have done, I think this is in, I think this is in uh, South Korea. I think in South Korea, if you if you pat someone on the head, um, it's considered very very disrespectful because they believe that your spirit is in your head. Don't ask me to explain that. I don't know how to explain it. All I know is I read a story about this guy. He was an American who went to South Korea, and they were like at they were at some gathering for like this young boy, and everyone's all excited. They're celebrating, and he and the and like he goes to con- congratulate the boy, and he taps the boy in his head, and everyone just looks at him like, "What have you just done?" Because it's considered disrespectful to do that. He didn't know the culture. He didn't. Know, he didn't know that was disrespectful. He didn't know that that was wrong in that culture. In the same way, people just did what they wanted to do, and no one had an idea of right or wrong. Um, but when the law came and showed you this is right and this is wrong, people were like, "Oh, okay, so this is wrong and that's right. Okay, I get it now." That's what the law was for. He says right here in 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 um, verse twenty. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in the sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law wasn't meant to save them. Does that make sense? It was just meant to show them that they need to be saved. <laughs> Literally. The the Moses brought the law to God's people to show that they can't do it. They can't they they can't obtain righteousness on their own. They need God in their lives. Does that make sense? And so people think like because I, I I even long time ago I had the thought of like why would God bring about laws that people couldn't do? It wasn't God didn't institute the laws so that they can fulfill all of it, all of it. God, God gave Moses the law to show them, hey, this is the standard of holiness and you can't obtain it. I'm showing you that you can't do this on your own. Does that make sense? Like that's what the law was for, to show us we can't do it on our own. Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through, the, through what? Well, right here, through faith, in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there's no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God set forth as appropriation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Wow, what he, he said a whole lot right there. What did he just say? Whew. Before Jesus came, God passed over the sins. Um, and, and we know that in, in that at the judgment seat, everyone in the everyone that died before Jesus, they're still going to be judged. Um, we're all going to be judged according to God's standard. Um, but in this day and age, salvation couldn't come to them because there, there, there was no savior. So all the law did was show them that they need a savior. And that's why we had Moses and all the other prophets allude to the there's someone coming who is a savior. And we know we need him because right now we're under the law. And now Paul is saying the savior has come and it's apart from the law. It's Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And it is through our faith in him, our belief in him, that we are made righteous, that we are made new. It is through being born again. And so now it's not that we don't have to worry about the law. It's that the is that now that we know we, we we've sinned now we've been made righteous through jesus and jesus summarized the entire law into two commandments love god and love people and if you do that then you'll fulfill all the other commandments in the law and so we don't have to worry about these hundreds of do's and don'ts all we have to worry about is loving god and loving people and that's what makes us righteous all the law did was show people you need a savior and now that we know the Savior, we don't need the law. Because Jesus has complete Jesus is the completion of the law. So all we have to worry about is following Jesus, obeying the truth that we read in the Bible, and that is sufficient for our righteousness. Amen. So what does that mean? The law doesn't save us. You know what that means? That our works don't save us. You can do 99% good things, but that 1% bad has made your entire life unrighteous we need someone to make us completely whole
completely clean. And that is Jesus. Amen. Amen. So verse 26, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. We are justified through Jesus. Amen. Amen. So Father, we thank you, Lord, that it is your spirit. Jesus is the one who justifies us. And so let us to continue to believe in you, continue to give us our obedience in our entire life, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. So keep in mind, keep in mind. So Paul here, he's writing to this church in Rome. And so we, we're going to see and hear a lot of this talk about being under the law and grace and the law and the grace and law and grace. And so just know that a lot of this is coming from people who... This is also new to them. Like, keep in mind for, because this is written, you know, geez, hold on, I mean, this this was written probably like 25, 30 years, maybe less after Jesus had died. So these, so everything Jesus did is still very fresh. Everyone say very fresh. And so what what are we do? What are what is Paul doing? What is Jesus doing? What is Peter doing? They're changing the traditions of men. They're changing a very ingrained, established culture that you can be saved through works, that you can become, that you can do things to make yourself righteous and holy. Again, this is why the Pharisees hated Jesus so much because they were setting people free from the law to just love Jesus, obey Jesus, and find their righteousness, find their cleansing through Jesus. Not Now we're no longer reliant on the religious elect, on the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We can just follow Jesus and, and obey Him and listen to Him and His teachings, that gospel, that good news. We don't need the Pharisees anymore. Does that make sense? And it's not that we didn't need the Pharisees. The Pharisees very well could have believed in Jesus, hopped on board, and now they could have started preaching the gospel in the temple to everyone to listen to. But no, they, they wanted to keep people in bondage, keep people reliant on what the Pharisees said. They wanted to, what, what, what Jesus said, you, 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 put these, you put these yokes on men that they can't fulfill. You put all these laws on, on them and you break people because they can't fulfill all these laws. And this is what you command of them. Does that make sense? And so Paul is, and Jesus and Peter and all the other disciples and Paul says, this is a culture that they're trying to break, that you are saved by your works, that you have control of your righteousness. And here's the thing, apart from Jesus, you don't. You really don't. You have sinned. And you are declared unrighteous. But when you accept Jesus, His Holy Spirit comes in you and He cleanses you. You are born again. You are a new creation. You are a new righteous creation. Amen. So we'll get, we'll get more into that. But Paul, he spends much of the letter explaining this in detail. Because a lot of this is just theology. Tomorrow we're going to read about Abraham and how he was counted righteous. And Abraham came before the law. How was Paul? How was Abraham made righteous before the law? Again, because the law is not what saves us. The law is what exposed, excuse me, exposed us to show us that, wow, we're messed up and we have no control over it. Does that make sense? So I'm just, I'm just trying to give you some context as to why this is so dense in him talking about the law. It's because he's trying to change the entire nation, ent entire culture to move from you're in control of salvation to you need Jesus for salvation. Does that make sense? Um, and you know what? And that's our culture today too. There's so many things, you know, for example, you know, in, 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 um, in Buddhism, you know, the Eightfold Path, this is what you must do. This is what you must do. Uh, you know, in the Hindu religions or in other world religions, this is what you need to do to appease the God. You, this is what you need to do to be righteous. This is what you need to do to be enlightened. And Christianity is different because Jesus says, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to take your place and I'm going to take your sins and I, I, I'm going to die so that you can be cleansed. It's different. Our God is different. Why? Because we serve the one true and living God. Amen. Amen. Let me pray. For, did I pray for you guys already? I think I did pray for you guys. So, Father, I thank you, Lord, 
that we hear this word and that we do it and that we're excited to learn from the book of Romans. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And amen. All right, so before I let you go, I want to remind you that people are our heart. Generosity is our opportunity. Excellence is our spirit. Smiling is our favorite. And Jesus is our Lord. We'll see you tomorrow at 10 a.m.